My name is Marty Schenkman and I'm joined by Jonathan Blotmacher and our topic for this video clip is going to be forms of ownership. There's a myriad of different ways you can structure ownership of an asset and the changes made by the 2017 Tax Act will have a significant impact on those. Uh, in addition, there's a number of creative options that too often get overlooked such as community property trusts and we'll talk about that as well. Um, any any starting point you want to tackle this kind of wide topic on? Well, Marty, uh, let's talk about it with respect to a married couple. Okay. And uh, if you're going to own something yourself, there are a lot of things you can do, like try to put it in some sort of entity to reduce the risk of a creditor being able to attach it or to avoid, say, a state income tax or something like that. But let's focus, I think, primarily on the ownership of property by spouses. Okay. And I think to begin, many, many couples, uh, especially in first marriage situations, like to own things together. So it's very common when a client will come in that they'll own their assets together. It'll be an account which says, you know, Janet and George Smith or whatever it happens to be. Let me just be. interject. What I, what I think actually the reality is most estate planning in our country is done by bank tellers because somebody goes to the bank or brokerage firm and opens an account and not even their advisor but the, the assistant that's doing the paperwork checks off a box and that's where a lot of title comes from. That is, which is often problematic. Absolutely true. And by the way, the form of ownership on that card may have a different result in one state than it does for another. In some states, when you have stuff owned by a husband and wife in one account, it's going to be either a joint tenancy with right of survivorship or possibly even a tenancy by the entirety, which again is a form of ownership by the spouses with a right of survivorship, which means when the first spouse dies, he or she can't control where his or her half interest goes, but it automatically goes to the survivor. And maybe in a first marriage situation that's okay. Not, not always. One of the problems I see is where a physician comes in, and let's say the wife is the physician and there's a, an asset owned jointly with the husband. If the husband dies, now the asset's owned outright by the physician's spouse and subject to liability claims. So even, even that too often is, is the wrong answer. Um, maybe we should comment on uh, asset protection benefits of tenants by the entirety and the differences in some state laws. Yeah, some states, like I understand in Pennsylvania, if a husband and wife own property is tenancy by the entirety, which again is a form of joint ownership with rights of survivorship, if one of the spouses has a claim against him or her, the creditors can't attach his or her interest in that asset because of the successor interest which the surviving spouse would get. So basically, you immunize it from claims of one of the spouse's creditors. So again, going back to your example, Marty, where you have a physician, perhaps she's in something like an OBGYN practice where there's a potential of high liability. Uh, if she owns things as tenants by the entirety in Pennsylvania with her husband, those assets may be immunized from claims of creditors. Now, an alternative is she could say, I'm going to give up all interest in this property and have everything just in my husband's name. But that denudes her of half of the value, whereas if... It's also risky, too, and I've seen this happen, where um, the non-risk spouse would hold title to all the assets. And I had a situation, tragic situation, the, the non-risk spouse had too much to drink, got in a horrific car accident, horrible lawsuit, they only had a million dollar excess liability policy and they were tagged for a very serious claim. So that, that's a, a cheap form of asset protection planning that has some real faults, so be careful. Also be very careful that tenants by the entirety is quite different from state to state. Some states have no protection at all. Correct. Some states only to a marital home, other states to other assets. So be very careful how you apply it. One of the things I know you've talked about, and I want to make sure we get in before uh, we conclude the video clip, um, is community property and how somebody such as myself who may live in uh, New Jersey, which is a non-community property state, could take advantage of community property laws by creating a trust in one of the states. I think Tennessee, Alaska, and South Dakota are the three states. I'm not sure if there's others that permit non residents to create a community property trust. Maybe you could describe, define community property and explain what these trusts may offer non-community property state residents. Community property is a big topic and it was really came about primarily because of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte where he 
drafted laws. He was a brilliant jurist and had community property throughout all of Europe other than England, which he never successfully invaded, didn't invade at all. But basically community property means that each spouse owns one half from inception when an asset is acquired during the marriage, basically by the activities of the spouse. It doesn't include inherited property. It doesn't include property that's received from a third party by gift. But if a husband or a wife makes money, it's community property. Each owns one half. There is one major, and it's a very big tax benefit, and that's Section 1014 B6 of the Internal Revenue Code, which basically says when the first spouse dies, not just his or her half of the community property gets that automatic change in basis, usually a stepped-up basis, but the survivors gets it as well. There's a long history as to why that came about, but if you're in New Jersey or in your New York or you're in Florida, you and your spouse own thing 50-50, you die, your half gets the step up in basis, the, the surviving half. spouses does not. But if you own community property, which we have in states like Louisiana, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, California, Washington State, Idaho, and Wisconsin, you get that double step up in basis. And I've tried very hard through the years to get New York to adopt a community property system by an opt-in system. All the states in the United States, other than the new ones like Alaska, have an opt-out system. You get married, everything you acquire is community property except to the extent you opt out. But there are some countries, like Germany, where you start with a separate property regime, but you can elect into community property. And there's a very important case called Angerhofer, decided by the tax court, which basically says if you do it the right way, you can create German community property and it will receive the community property benefits here in the United States. So what can you do? Well, Alaska in 1998 adopted an opt-in community property system. And I'm a member of the Alaska Bar, and all my friends who are members of the Alaska Bar say virtually all married couples create at least some community property to get that and potentially some other benefits of community property. But the Alaska legislature said, by the way, even if the couple does not live in Alaska, they can create Alaska community property by creating an Alaska community property trust. And I've done it for many, many of my clients. In fact, if you properly explain it to a client, I can't see why they wouldn't do it. Because even if you have $10 million and your wife has $50 million, you could each put 10 into the trust. You're still going to own half. If you get divorced, you're going to get half. But now it means it will be community property under the laws of the state of Alaska at the time you die, so you get that double step up in basis. So the, 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 the hot buzzword in the estate planning world is basis step up, right? So if I die and I have an asset I bought for $100 and it's worth $100,000, the basis is increased. It's really an adjustment because it can go the other way too, but nobody ever seems to focus on that. But why isn't there more uh, talk or attention given to the use of a community property trust in one of the jurisdictions that permits it, given the focus on basis and the incredible tax benefit from an income side it could provide. Marty, it's been a mystery to me, and I've spoken to some of the best non-community property estate planners in the United States, and I think it's because of their lack of familiarity with community property. Now, there are two or three things you can do. Number one, you can call somebody who's a friend in a community property state who can give you some background. Second, community property is a very, very close first cousin to a tenancy in common where you and your spouse own 50% each. Now, Tennessee has done it as well. South Dakota has tried to do it. I don't want to get into the detail. I do not think that you can create something that would get that double step up in basis by creating what is labeled as community property under South Dakota law. It's a very complicated area to deal with, but I certainly think it's worthwhile you're learning about it and explaining it to your clients because there are tremendous opportunities. By the way, you can pick and choose. Maybe you only put appreciated assets into the community property trust. I used to have those before the recent market. Ah. <laughs> let, me, let me get one last topic in because we've got to wrap up on property title. So one of the things that we historically had done for lots of clients for lots of years, maybe more than years, 
was if a typical couple came to us, we would have them divide assets. So on the first death, each spouse would have money, whoever died first, to fund a credit shelter trust to get assets out of the estate. For a lot of people, that's irrelevant because with the current high exemptions, even with the exemptions when they get cut in half in 2026, there may not be the need to fund a credit shelter trust, but more important, we now have portability. So if one spouse dies, if an estate tax return is filed, the surviving spouse can port or get the uh, deceased spouse unused exemption, the DSU, um, from the surviving spouse. I think one of the things we should all be looking at is whether or not old structures in terms of which spouse owned which asset should be revisited. It may make more sense, for example, to have something now owned tenants by the entirety because of a measure of asset protection rather than divided in order to fund a credit shelter trust which may not be necessary or optimal anymore. Any, any final closing comments on title to assets? No, I think that's a very important point and again, titling assets is a critical aspect of estate planning. Oh, and one of the things that we wanted to say because we talked about it before, um, you need to monitor this. Everybody needs to monitor this periodically. The estate planning team, the financial advisor, investment advisor, accountant, everybody needs to be alert to this because there's, there's this tendency over time for title once corrected to kind of shift the wrong way. So somebody moves to a new brokerage firm or a new wealth advisor and somehow things get retitled. Somebody buys a new house and the real estate attorney changes what the title of the old house which was intended to something different just because that's what they typically do. So we need to all monitor this. And in closing, um, this has uh, been presented for educational purposes and we have not rendered any tax or legal advice. Thank you for joining us.